on today's episode of Wiskerman's podcast, Beards in Business. In the beard section, learn the history starting with Caveman all the way up to today. And in the business section, we have a special guest, Jesse Gaither from Minuteman Press. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another Wiskerman's podcast, Beards in Business. This is the beard section. But today we're going to start it off a, a little different. For those of you that may know me uh, and know uh, some of my history growing up, um, I wanted to uh, pay respect and homage to a, a man who uh, retired. Uh, for those of you that know, you know that uh, I was a, a big wrestling fan in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. So I wanted to uh, start the show off with saying thank you to the black and white Sting, not the singer, but uh, feeling that Sting's colors match Wiskerman. So uh, for those of you that know, Sting has been around since the 80s as a wrestler, WCW, WWE, WWF, whatever you want to call it, uh, AEW, and he had his final match uh, this past Sunday. It was pretty cool to see his sons come out, so uh, a little bit of uh, nerding out there. So thank you to uh, Sting for a great career and entertaining us for so many years. And Sting was one of the, the few that kind of uh, didn't fall into a lot of the bad habits and stuff and kind of stayed true to his religion. So, why did I do that? One, because it's my show and I can do that. Two, I like wrestling. And then three, today's show is going to be about history. So I gave you a little bit of history behind me and where I came uh, following wrestling. But today we're going to pull a little bit of uh, from the book. Um, this is the very first one. So it has not for resale. So today we're going to talk about history. So beards have been around for the all the way back to the beginning of time. Um, I'm pretty sure Adam had a beard. Uh, that's why Eve was attracted to him. Because he had a beard. If not, it would be a whole new, different story. But So starting with the earliest form of man... Going back to cavemen days, the beard played a different role than what it does today. Today, we, we kind of have beards more of a, as a, a style. Going back in time, looking at the caveman, the caveman used hair everywhere, uh, obviously because they didn't have the ability to shave and didn't have amazing products like Westerman has, but they used it for several different things. One was warmth. Clearly, the more hair you have, the warmer you are, uh, in theory. Um, you know, it... it it shielded their face from the, the bitter cold and stuff. So that's why cavemen have beards, long hair, hairy chest, and all that stuff. Because they used it. But one thing that most people don't realize is uh, they you also use their beard as a um, a filter. So if they were, you know, in a in a, um, a burning area, they could take their beard and hold it up over their, their face and nose. Mine's a little bit short right now, but it kind of comes up. And do something similar to this, right? So it's at least filtering out some of the smoke and uh, things that they're inhaling. Um, then as, as we move through past caveman and into actual like modern document times, um, looking at the ancient civilizations, and I apologize that I'm looking down at my notes here, but um, you know you look at the the start of starting with the Mesopotamians. Um, you know they they were. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers were two of the big areas, but you will always see kings and nobles from that time period all having these amazing beards, some very well uh, braided and, and just glorious and documented in history, whether it's through uh, marble paintings, um, marble or paintings, I'm sorry. Um, then you move into clearly uh, one... Um, group of folks that really embraced the beard game uh, in life and even in afterlife is the Egyptians. So the Egyptians um, definitely had that to where, you know, the famous, um, one of the most famous depictations is, is King Tut. While they may not have had the full beard, they the King Tut has the this here only underneath the, the chin beard. And it is even said that women would make uh, beards out of different animals because the Egyptian culture believed so big in that that facial hair, and it was just something about it that they believed in. Were it, it was a thing of honor to have facial hair during the Egyptian period. Then some of the smartest human beings 
uh, in the history of time uh, were from, you know, Greek philosophers uh, like Plato. Um, not the stuff that you, you sculpt with or eat. Um, it does taste very good, but Plato, uh, the philosopher, has an amazing beard. No hair on his daggum head, but embraced it uh, on his face. Uh, most of those guys, Socrates, uh, those folks you always will see having some types of beard. So maybe there's a little correlation. You're smarter with a beard. Um, in my case, I, I'm not not sure that the, the jury's still out on that one. So but then we transition to the Roman period. You have gladiators who had beards because of the fact that you would not see a noble person having a beard during that time for the main reason of the Romans were out fighting and conquering everyone. And the thought was, if you are in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's one more thing that the enemy could grab on and use against you. So the, the Romans were predominantly clean-shaven because they were the warriors. The As we transition through to Indian culture, um, some of their gods are depicted with beards. Um, so it's very predominant in there um, that they, they would grow their beards. It plays a central role um, in the sh sheet. It is forbidden to cut or trim your facial hair um, because it's a devotion to their uh, their God. And then as we get into beards, in, we're starting to talk into the world of religion. Obviously the biggest and probably one of the best beards of all times and will continue to win awards because otherwise he will strike us down is uh, Jesus Christ is always depicted with that nice, beautiful beard, uh, and that nice, flowing, long hair. So clearly one of the biggest uh, religious symbols for Christianity, Jesus had a beard. Um, but it's not uncommon for uh, when you look at the um, Orthodox Jews, they will grow out their beards, and they will also have the uh, the curls on their side. I, I, pardon me for not knowing exactly. I'm not trying to read word for word. Um, but then going back to the the Indian, the Sikhs, they would wear theirs, uh, and again, going back, they would not cut it as a sign to their god. Um, and it, in that world, it's it's very common to see men with beard and facial hair. Um, then you get into, we, we move through, uh, I know I'm bouncing around a lot, I'm trying to just give you a general history on beards as it's laid out in the book. We move into the Renaissance period. And one of the most famous people to come from there is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, always depicted with this beautiful, uh, looking at one of the pictures that's in the book, besides long hair, his beard is almost identical to mine. A little bit longer. If I get uh, down to here, I would, could be Leonardo da Vinci. Um, sounds like a, a, a challenge for the Halloween coming up. Then we move through till the next uh, part of the area in the 19th century. With the Victorian age, and we see Charles Darwin uh, again, classic, no hair on the head, little hair on the side, but this beautiful long beard. Um, then we move into the 20th century. The 20th century is where the beard kind of got a little bit of a, a negative look, and this is where we stood for a, a while. Of folks that had beards were more looked upon as. You know, they were being rebelling um, and the anti-culture. And that, uh, as they referred to them back in the 50s, um, were beatniks. And then they were called hippies in the 60s. So there was a lot of negative condensation with facial hair that carried out. And had, kind of, we'll get into a little bit more deeper. Kind of has stayed up until the last, um, you know, five, ten years. Never, uh, during this time frame... You know, you really didn't see a whole lot of, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 100, um, these big company businessmen. You really don't recall, you know, fr from probably the 50s until most recently, um, beards being predominant on, you know, the quote-unquote working uh, middle class and then definitely wouldn't see someone in the upper class. So you fast forward to um, the events that uh, actually were almost to the day. That uh, we actually might be the day I have to fact check that. Um, we got shut down because of the virus uh, known as COVID or Chinese virus, depending on where you get your news from. Um, after that, we, you know, that 
COVID did a lot of bad things. Um, I'm not downplaying that COVID was one of the one of the most destructive things we will see in our lifetime. Hopefully, nothing bigger comes along. But the good thing, every rose has a thorn, but every rose has beautiful petals and is a rose. After all, is more folks started working from home and they were uh, on video as you're watching now, and video became really blew up. But since they were at home. Um, you know, most people decide to stay in their PJs longer. Um, not so cool, but most men decided, why am I taking the time to shave? Um, I'm just going on video. Half the time people weren't turning their cameras on. And then when we went into this new hybrid of the world post COVID, we saw that most men didn't put down, uh, pick back up the razors and kept their beards. So now you're seeing beards almost everywhere. Um, a lot of you know a lot of pro sports players are more into some form of beards uh it, we're getting closer and closer to april which means you're gonna start seeing playoff beards for the uh, hockey fans um so it's it's becoming more predominant and mainstream today that wasn't necessarily in the 80s 90s so it really took something so negative that you have to find a positive that more facial hair came out. And then now it's almost accepted. Um, you know, and then that's where Whiskerman plays a big part of, you know, we were, we know where we came from. Beard being a, a warmth and um, in the caveman days. And then, you know, we transition through history and then we get into the 50s, 60s where it was looked upon as you were, uh, you know, a degenerate if you had a, a beard to so where we are today. And you can still be looked upon negatively if you just have this, you know, if, if I was in a, a work environment, my beard was just all over a place like this, I would probably be looked at as, you know, um, someone who's unkept. So Whiskerman comes in and we want to make sure that you uh, facial hair lovers and those that grow the facial hair always have the most magnificent and beautiful looking beards. And as we covered multiple times, and we'll continue to go back to it, the foundation of having a beard wash, the beard oil, the beard butter, and then something to comb your beard with. And then the extras that we talked about, straightener, bombs, we'll get into waxes in a, a, a few shows, and then different styling things will make you look professional with a beard. So as long as you take care of it, you will look the best you can. And no one will look down, refer to you as a hippie or a beatnik, hopefully. So, little history, short and sweet. Um, we got to know where we came from to know where we are. So, nice, short, uh, very abbreviated. There's a lot more. Um, please pick up my book, uh, From Stubble to Style, Complete Guide to Beard Mastery. Um, this is me. This is my teenage son. Um, amazing. I'm very proud of this book, so please uh, buy this. It is, you can find it on our, our um, in our store at wuskerman.com or you can purchase it through Amazon. It's easier to purchase it through me. I would prefer that, but it is available on Amazon. So um, this concludes the beard section. We've got an amazing guest coming up for you uh, here and I will turn it over to our pre-recorded guests. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to this section of business. We have a very special guest. Um, I've got to know this gentleman uh, a lot over the last couple of uh, months and honored to um, be associated with the organization that he runs that we'll get into later. But uh, without any further ado, Jesse, if you could introduce yourself and uh, go right into your business for us, please. Yeah. Um, my name is Jesse Gaither. I own uh, Minuteman Press, Centerville, Ohio. Um, been an owner here for about seven and a half years. Um, the business has been here a little more than 20 years, but um, I am the uh, the third owner and, uh, and you know, we provide all uh, uh, full service, graphic design, print marketing, direct mail, promotional products, apparel, signage, trade show booths, pretty much anything a company needs to, uh, to brand and promote their business and drive sales. Yeah. And what's funny is before I met you, I never heard of Minuteman Press. And then it was shortly after uh, we met back in June that uh, I had started seeing that it's one of the top uh, franchises for veterans to go into, yeah. um, that military.com presses uh, Minuteman Press. So um, 
you know, full print and then beyond printing of, you can pretty much print almost anything is, is accurate to say, correct? That you can do the booths and the signs and all that stuff. That it's more than just paper, uh, what most people would traditionally think of. Sure. Yeah. Fran uh, Minuteman is the largest print franchise in the world. There's over 900 stores and, and there, you're right. There are a lot of veteran owners out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it started off as kind of a quick copy shop uh, on Long Island. Um, but we've, uh, you know, evolved over the years to become kind of marketing extensions, uh, you know, for small uh, businesses. Um, we support businesses of all sizes, large, you know, uh, Fortune 500 kind of companies, but um, but really our focus is uh, local micro enterprise, and um, we do logo creation, uh, branding, identity guides, um, and and yeah, again the whole uh, kind of pantheon, if you will, of marketing materials. Um, so um, every shop's a little different. Ours uh, is is very much focused on you know heavy on the art side, heavy on the design side, um, and and more custom work. Um, other shops might just do more com commodity printing for the government or whatever. And that's not, that's not an area I really want to play with. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got the, the privilege to, to have, you know, interacted with you. So I, I've got some questions that I, I normally wouldn't have with just a regular guest. So having talked to you and interacted um, over the last several months, um, I know personally that there's probably a hundred million other things that I could put that say Jesse could be a business owner in this and run it and be successful. So well, thank my, you. My question is, with that being said, why of all the options that you could have potentially went into, why did you land at Miniman Press to, to run that? So um, it kind of a long story. I mean, I, I had a, a pretty good career in, uh, in, of all things, analytical chemistry. I was an analytical chemist for, for a long time, worked in the sciences, uh, for for most of my career, um, but I grew up in printing. Um, so my grandparents owned a, owned a newspaper, uh, actually a, three newspapers on the east side of Cincinnati, just small community newspapers, and um, and that's where my parents met. My dad was a designer for the newspaper. My mom was a writer. Uh, that's they they met back in uh, when my dad got um, got back from Vietnam, and. Um, and they married and then started their own publishing company for my dad's artwork. This is some of my dad's artwork right there. I don't know if you can see it, the, ti the tiger. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's all I knew growing up, growing up was the newspaper and my dad's art and marketing. And, and, um, uh, but by the time I was in high school, uh, my grandparents sold their newspaper to the Cincinnati Enquirer. My dad sold his publishing company to his partner and kind of retired and became a professional fisherman. And, um, and I was, all, you know, left to my own devices to figure out a career. I'm good in the sciences. So I went in into chemistry, but, um, but it, there came a point where I, I knew that at some time in my fifties, um, my career in chemistry was going to be um, kind of out of my control that, you know, I was seeing a lot of, of, of uh, chemists and scientists uh, that were getting replaced by, you know, uh, by recent college grads. Um, and I told my wife, like, I'm not going to be the master of my own destiny if I stay in the chemistry field. So uh, we started looking for a business to buy um, and printing made all the sense in the world. It was like coming home. You know, uh, I'd known it. it. Obviously, the industry's changed a ton since, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s. Um, become a lot more sophisticated in many ways, but it was a great fit. It scratches both sides of my brain. You know, it's left side, right side, technical, creative, lots of interactions with people, um, you know, very tight on the numbers and margins are tight. So, you know, we're talking about, we call it a penny game, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, so the, that business management part is there as well as like the relationship management. So it, it's just a perfect fit for me. I should have done it 10 years earlier, uh, but it, but we're having a great time. And, and again, I, I haven't been happier in, in, in my kind of path of careers, you know? Yeah. What's interesting, you know, I was thinking about this uh, as we were getting ready for this interview, my first grown-up job, if you would, um, I, and I'm, I'm a little fuzzy with my memory, 
can't remember if I worked at Burger King first or if that was my last job prior to going to the military. But I do know for one summer that I worked at a, a, a print press shop to where I was in charge of, you know, stapling the magazines together. So it, it's funny how yeah, I never thought of that up until uh, prepping for this. So it's really interesting. So um, where can people find you? If, you know, if there's another business in the, the Dayton area that wants to use you and then we can we'll definitely make sure we put your stuff up at the end. But if someone's looking to go, hey, I really need a, a print job. Um, and Jesse seems like a, a great, trustworthy person, which I vouch for. That is an accurate statement. How could they get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, phone number, email, website. So our phone number is 937-436-5290. Um, best email would be uh, C is in Charlie, S is in Sam, the number one, at minutemanpress.com. And that's just customer service one, right? So CS1 at minutemanpress.com. And our website is centerville.minutemanpress.com. So um, those are the three easiest ways. Um, another great way is, is just come out into the community. You know, I mean, we're very active. My wife and I are very active throughout, you know, the Miami Valley from, you know, Bellbrook, Centerville, Miamisburg, Springboro, particularly Lebanon. And, uh, you know, I'm involved in a lot of activity, a lot of volunteership uh, within the community. The Centerville Noon Optimist Club uh, has been always wonderful for me. I've, I'm very involved in BNI, Business Network International, uh, the local chambers. And then, you know, the thing that's nearest and dearest to me is the heart of Centerville, Washington Township. Um, you know, when I first joined, when I first bought Minuteman Press and came to Centerville um, and, and discovered the heart, um, you know, it was 20 small business owners in the, in the area that were, you know, there to support each other. Um, and, uh, and the, I don't know, the family nature of the organization really uh, drew me in. I'm now the uh, president of the heart and we've grown to over 240 members. And, and that, um, you know, for those that have been in it, you know, six months or six years, um, will all attest it's more than a chamber of commerce. It's more than a networking group. It's a group of, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and, and managers of large, large businesses that are all in it to support our local, uh, our local economy and, uh, and, and be, I don't know, a resource for each other. Um, and it just, it, it, it takes some of the best things of a chamber of commerce or a, or a purely networking group uh, and combines that with a family atmosphere that um, I've just never experienced anything like it. So um, that would be where I'd say, you know, lean into the community, um, get involved, and uh, you'll see me around town. Yeah, and that's one of the things, uh, obviously, uh, we met um, through a mutual friend and said, come check it out. And you, you go to the first meeting and you're like, wow, this is, this is really, I remember sitting there going, this is really weird because yeah. most of the networking events are somewhat transactional for a lack of better word and the, the coffee for the heart was the complete opposite it was like a, a bunch of friends just sharing some information um and you know what a what a great organization and the uh i know this weekend unfortunately i wasn't able to be part of it um because the wife and i had a previous commitment but the community is more than just business yeah. in the sense of you had to uh, help your wife relocate uh, shop and you had about a dozen or so folks show up on a Saturday morning and help. So it's, it's more than just business. It, it actually becomes a family. Um, yeah. I think we probably had what 50 or so show up for your uh, 21st birthday a, a month ago. <laughs> but it's really a family. Um, it really is. It really yeah. is. No, I, my father-in-law meant, you know, my father-in-law commented on Saturday when we were helping my wife move, he said, um, wow, what, what a community you have. How, how do, how do you do this? And I said, well, you know, we're there for each other. You know, we've been there for them when they needed support in all kinds of different ways. Um, and you know, there's a, there's an expression in BNI, it might even be trademarked called the giver's gain, right? Um, the more you give, the more you gain kind of thing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. You know, if you, if you make yourself open uh, you know, open yourself up, I should say, to opportunities to help uh, anywhere within your community. The community is going to going to reciprocate that and and it and and multiply it. So my wife's business, Oregonia Soapworks, um, 
uh, yeah, we had a great time. You know, people didn't, we were done with the work and nobody wanted to leave. You know, <laughs> it was, we just, uh, you know, they weren't, they, one person said, you know, and I, you hear this at, at any of the, uh, any time that we're helping each other in business is, you know, I'm here for you, whatever needs to be done, we're just going to do it. But at the end of the day, I just, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to spend time with these people, you know? Yeah. And it's completely opposite from, you know, regardless of where we're getting our, our media, you know, everything's so negative of we're, we're so divided, but yeah, you get folks from, you know, all different walks of life that are like, I'm really here for you. I could care less what we're moving. I mean, you know, in, in some cases we could be shuffling bodies and just moving them around and they'd still show up because they're there for you, which is amazing. Um, yeah. I do know uh, I'm going to um, throw this out in the universe right now. I'm going to have you come back as a guest when we get closer to October, because there's something special that I got to uh, have the blessing of being involved in. I know you're heavily involved in uh, Veterans Day event to honor one of our local veterans. So definitely want to put that out there. It's now captured a moment in the time that I will have you back and we're going to do an entire segment uh, on that. So those are all the questions I have for the business. And then when we're done, I want to give you a chance to add some things, but I've got two really um, interesting questions that I like to, to ask. Um, one, because it, it kind of, it's almost selfish, but I know if it's something that I want to hear, I know it's something the audience wants to hear. So what feeds you? And my example is I like audio books and I love being part of, you know, being in the heart and getting that, that mentor and, and that, you know, connection of, with other businesses. What is it for you? And if applicable, what's an example that you would point someone to? What you, you mean? Like what, what feeds my soul? Yeah. So like what, what keeps you going? Like, I know there's days that I'm like, I really don't want to do this business, but yet it's Friday and I show up to a heart meeting. I'm like, okay, I'm around all these people that are, have more extraordinary circumstances that they're facing and move forward or what feeds your soul. I'm very open to, you know, what keeps you going really? The, I think, it, and I, the reason that this business is so, I don't know, such a, a good fit for me is, um, is relationships with, and, and being inspired by uh, lots of successful people, right? Like the inspiration that I get from uh, that, that young entrepreneur that's just so fired up about, you know, this passionate thing that they want to pursue and that they give me an opportunity to join with them in that passion. Like, you know, whether it's a business card or a brochure or just a really cool t-shirt design, whatever it is, and they're pumped up about it, right? And that feeds me because they're looking for somebody to, you know, to, to help them, uh, you know, realize their dreams, right? And we do that by bringing it to life in, in color and in print and products, right? Labeling, whatever it is like, and, and that, you know, in the seven years I've been here, I've never had that Friday you're describing. Like I, every day for me is, I can't wait to get into the office or get to that, that first meeting of the day and, and be inspired by another business owner. Um, but it also gives me an opportunity to, you know, to kind of walk, to, you know, share some experience and mentor people at lots of different stages in their career, because we all deal with business challenges, right? And so I learn from them how they manage their challenges and, and, and I can share some insight on how I've managed my own, right? Um, in terms, so that's my like business motivation. I love what I do and I love helping people realize their dreams. As far as my soul, it's music and travel. I mean, you know, I, my wife, my family, we take, you know, a three week vacation every year um, get away from the shop, get away from everything. And that time with my family is just about as precious as it gets. Um, so, um, yeah, those are the, the, that, does that answer the question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that, that's awesome. I never thought of it from that perspective of you're able to take that. I'm, I'm sure sometimes panicked business owner that's like, Hey, I have this event or I need this graphic and I don't even know where to go. And you just kind of calm them down and walk through hand in hand which is, is one of the things that drew me into you, your your mentorship, even in the, the brief couple of minutes that we were talking at the event where we first met, you, you were willing to pass on knowledge and just always open. Um, 
Now, my next question, I like this for a couple of different reasons. One, I like to see where people go is the main reason. But I also like to throw this image out to every guest um, because th they inadvertently will see themselves doing this. So we don't have to put on the costume and we don't have to go on the naval vessel, but we need to put ourselves as share for a moment and turn back time. So if we could turn back time at any moment in your life, whether it's three, five, yesterday, what would Jesse today tell younger Jesse that could change either personal, professional, wherever it is, something you'd be like, if I could turn back that clock, this is something I would tell my younger self. Yeah. So, um, first of all, I, I you know, uh, uh, I wouldn't turn back the clock. I love where I am right now. Right. But, um, but I wouldn't be where I am right now with all of those, without all of those, you know, experiences and that, uh, long and winding road, um, that, that it took to get me here. Um, the one thing I would tell my younger self and and I and I try to tell my my daughters I have a 21 year old and a 14 year old is um, follow your passion first right F know what's what's passionate in your heart um, you can make a career and be a professional and make a fortune doing anything uh, but make sure you're doing something that you really have a passion for I, I didn't have a passion for analytical chemistry I was not even a very good chemist you know, but I was good <clears throat> with people and I was good with relationships. I was good with, you know, coaching and mentoring. So I, I went into management very quickly um, in, in the chemistry field. And I, did, I didn't recognize that it was the relationships, it was the people that I had a passion for, not the job, not the product, right? And so to follow that passion, try to you know, do some soul searching young. And, um, you know, my 21 year old daughter, when she was, well, I go back, my 14 year old daughter now is saying, well, dad, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I tell her I'm 51 years old and I don't either. Right. I I'm not done. This is this, these have just been stepping stones of in time. I've been, you know, you know, I've loved everything I've done. I've given everything I've done throughout my life. The, the most that I could give it, um, but there was also a time to take that next step and do that next thing and, and take, you know, be brave to brave enough to, you know, take some risks, uh, calculated, uh, as they might've been, but to take the risk, uh, in pursuit of that next better thing that gets you closer to, uh, to where you're going to be happiest in life. And, you know, I will pro it'll probably be my last career whatever that is, whenever that is in my eighties or whatever, the last thing that I do will probably be the closest to my soul. That's awesome. So my favorite part of the show and the scariest part of the show, because I never know where it's going to go. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Anything that uh, you want to add, any questions, we can go anywhere you want. Um, the show is officially now Jesse with Minute Man Press podcast. Um. I guess my question, you know, I'd reflect it back to you, John, you know, like, you know, where, where do you see yourself on, in your trajectory? Like, you know, you're, you're, you're off on your own adventure, right? And you're doing things that I never would do, like a podcast, I'd never even think to do that, right? right. Um, but you're, you're, you're in this, I'm, I'm curious to hear kind of where you feel like you are in your career. Um, and you know, what your kind of mid to long range goals are. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the person and I don't do this since I don't drink of hold my beer, watch this. And I go do it cause I don't have a filter. Mine is through the aspect of, I get these good ideas and there is no filter. And damn, if someone says I can't do it because then I'm just gonna, that goes to the front burner. Um, and I did that with, uh, you know, my, as, as we were chatting beforehand, getting on, you can see, I can't spell. I, I probably looking back, I probably have a, a, a slight case of dyslexia. Um, I came up with this idea. I'm writing a book. And I know previously people said, you, you, I've heard that I was never going to do good in school. Damn it, I wrote a book. It's published. It's out there. So it's in the universe. Same thing was like, hey, what a good idea to just bring folks together and do a podcast. Okay, I'm going to do it. You know, what, whether, whether it fails, I'm putting everything into it is the way I go into everything. From a business trajectory, I 
I want to, I see the world is changing so fast and I want to always be um, one step ahead. So leaning forward, I see this becoming a, um, a distribution franchise, not 100% franchised in the fact that, you know, they won't, someone who buys it won't outright own the right of Whiskerman, but they'll have the ability to distribute the products. Uh, and what that looks like in a bigger picture is I want to have 50, preferably veterans or veteran spouses somewhere tied to the military community in each state that go out and do the events like we do with the heart of Centerville to where I can just now travel around the country and watch and see how these folks are doing that. So that's the future of Wiskerman. Um, hopefully, you know, it, it's a, I had set it as a three to five year. Um, I'm trying to push harder for that three year to get that going only because it's, you know, at some point it, you can only do so many weekends of constantly gone. And I'm sure you can relate with that, uh, you know, helping your wife's business of uh, being out at different events and, you know, running a brick and mortar. So that's kind of where my trajectory, I hope, is going. You know, it's uh, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like having children, you know, like you're so you you're enjoying life so much that you want to, you know, you want to you want to share it and you want you want to replicate it, you know, uh, and share that that experience and that that success with other people. Um, and uh, uh, and I think that's brilliant, you know, that uh, that you're going to, you know, share your model. Um, you know, as you know, you know, my wife's company, Oregonia Soapworks, um, you guys overlap uh, quite a bit. And uh, and I kind of encourage that with her. You know, why don't you why don't you sell distribution rights and 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 do this? And and uh, she doesn't, you know, she's very, my wife, Shannon, uh, recognizes that she, at, the, at her heart, she's just a maker. She mm -hmm. just likes making stuff. And, and she, she never had any aspirations for it to be anything other than just a local soap company, you know? And she was very honest with herself very early in the business. She celebrates 10 years next month. And, uh, um, and, that, and it's, it's exactly what she wants it to be, right? Um, and I, I had to, I don't know, I had to accept her, um, you know, her own ambition. Like for me, I was like, let's make it big. We're going to be Burt's Bees. You know, we're going to be this huge thing and we're going to be in every grocery store. And she's like, no, I'll be okay if I'm just in a couple of retail shops, uh, you know, throughout the Miami Valley. And that's where she is. And she's, ex she couldn't be happier with what she does. And that's, that's a conversation I love having with new business folks. Like, what is your goal? Is it, is it just you? Is it you and your family? Is, are you, is it going to be a legacy business that you pass along to your kids? Do you want to franchise this? Do you want multiple locations? Like, what is it? What looks like success to you? And for my wife and I, I mean, we're 51 years old now. And, and, uh, and, and we've realized that like we've, we've achieved the goals that we want to achieve. You know, we, we, our ambition is starting to dwindle, to be honest. Like we are, we, I don't, you know, it's not like we've been to the mountaintop. I don't, you know, we're, we're no Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk and never will be, but in our lifetime, we've, we've achieved, achieved the success that we, that we wanted and, and we're, we'll be fine to kind of sail off into the sunset. Yeah, that's awesome. And I want to, I want to make sure to make it clear of that was not where I wanted to be when we, when we started this. It was to do kind of this similar with your wife, but where my viewpoints have changed is because of being around folks uh, like the group at the heart, having been um, part of different business boot camps and stuff and starting that, just have those little seeds. And I saw the opportunities and that's why it's a long way to come back around and say, I respect that your wife is in 10 years of business being true to herself. Because some people will come out and be like, that's not me. And they still do it because they think that's what's expected. Um, right. You need, uh, I know one business class I went into, they said, you should enter into business with an exit strategy. Well, yeah, yes, but no, I want to love it. If I'm already thinking of the death of the business, how, how can I love it when I'm already planning its funeral? So that, that was kind of the approach. Right. So, um, you know, one, any, any other final parting shots, anything you want to add before we close it down? No, I, you know, if this is geared towards, uh, towards, you know, 
anybody in the community, whatever you're doing, uh, you know, whether you're a business owner, or you, you know, you work, um, uh, I, I would just say, you know, the, the best um, thing you can do for yourself and your family is to be involved in whatever it is uh, that you have a passion for, um, to, to lean in and have, uh, you know, know that there's, there's an enormous amount of need out there uh, for people um, uh, in, in, in any, anything that you would want to do, whether it's mental health or childhood education, uh, veterans, animal welfare, human rights, whatever it is, there's a place for you to, to apply yourself and your passion um, and, uh, and help your community. Um, and the rewards the, the, are, are just basically endless. And, uh, um, and, and just get out there and, and, uh, and, and open yourself up to, uh, to the needs in your community. Well said. If we had a mic, we would drop it right there. <laughs> uh, Jesse, thank you so much for being on uh, the podcast. And for those of you that are, that are at home, uh, we're about to close it down. You've made it all the way through. So thank you so much for watching and we look forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse, for uh, jumping on once again. We appreciate it. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the, learning a little bit about the world of uh, Minuteman and what they do and all the different services that they offer. And then the, the look into the uh, servant heart that Jesse has as far as being inside the president of the heart of Centerville. And uh, we'll look at digging a little bit deeper into the heart of Centerville and kind of do a, a special uh, business for that one of these days. Um, and then, as promised, as we get closer to November, we're going to do a, a special episode all about the Veterans Day event that we alluded to. So, guys, as always, if you made it to this part of the, the podcast, thank you so much. Please uh, hit that subscribe button, share it with your friends, help us grow this, uh, and continue to watch these episodes each week. It, it means the, the from the bottom of my heart, it means a lot to me. That you take the time to get to this point. So, as always, thank you to our first responders, our military, and our veterans. Folks, if you can't get behind them, feel free to get in front of them. Until next time.